ladies and gentlemen, Aaron D. Singh Bhagwal is here to talk to you today about effective computer software validation. Please. And Joey, you've pronounced my name perfectly. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And I encourage you to pronounce everything in your presentation perfectly so that we may clearly understand the very best practices and the common Perfect. So to avoid Before your... we begin today, I was going to prepare a few slides, but I've kept it super simple because I'm more of a show and tell guy rather than presentation. So what we're going to be talking about today is computer software validation in the scope of a quality management system. So not in terms of, so for example, I know that uh, Melissa mentioned she's from a SAMD company. So not the validation of the software itself in a medical device, but computer software validation in terms of quality management system to ISO 13485, CFR820, and also MDSAP. So what we're gonna be talking about today is understanding what is CSV and what are the best practices? What are the common mistakes that I often see about that? So in terms of an overview, what we're gonna be talking about is computer software validation and computer systems insurance. I know the FDA recently had some guidance that recently came about CSA. So we're gonna talk about the difference between the two. Uh, we're also gonna be covering what is the purpose of CSV? Why do we do it and why is it important? Uh, another important one is, of course, is which software is in the scope of your computer software validation? How do you determine whether a software needs to be validated or not, and the level of which it needs to be done to? We're also going to be talking about the risk assessment as well. If there's a software that you're using that's of a high risk, of course, you're going to be wanting to do a higher level of validation to it. Whereas if you're using something that's potentially of a low risk, you maybe just want to do the most basic of validation of it. The important one, of course, is that there could be some kinds of computer systems that require no validation for something like a medical device. Yes, so if it's not in the scope of your quality management system, then you don't really need to validate it. As in, if there's nothing like, for example, like a HR software, which I'll talk on to later on. So depending on what you're using the HR software for, it's possible that it needs validation or it's possible that it doesn't. So it really depends on the scope of the software. What's it actually doing? And then of course is how to actually conduct the validation. And because this is such a silly thing that I see with some companies like, hey, have you validated your software? Yes, can you show me reports of that? And the report just says that we did X, Y, Z. Okay, but where's your evidence? Did you take screenshots? Did you take screen captures? Did you make a video of it? Like, where's your actual evidence? You know, me just saying something doesn't mean anything. I can claim that I'm president of the UK. Where's the evidence for that? And again, common mistakes, that's another one I'm going to be covering as well. And the most important thing is revalidation and monitoring. Now, in the old days, you know, you used to buy a software like, so, you know, Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows 2000, version 1, 2, 3, et cetera. If you're using a lot of cloud platforms, they're changing all the time. So how on earth do you keep up with that? How do you know whether that's going to be affecting your device? Is there any features in there, et cetera? So revalidation is a very important one. And of course, monitoring. How do you keep up with the updates? Because if you see things like GitHub, Jira, Atlassian systems, they're updating all the time and it happens automatically. So how do you know whether that change is going to be affecting it or not? So the first one we need to start off with is CSV and CSA. CSV, Computer Software Validation. CSA computer software assurance. So CSV is a form of software validation that relies heavily on testing to provide the objective evidence. CSV is the old system. Now I know the FDA is moving towards a more sensible system, which is computer software assurance, which you take the risk-based approach. If something is of a lower risk, you know, you don't need to sit there doing a hundred different tests, et cetera. So it's important that people understand the difference. So the idea here is basically, I know the FDA is moving towards CSA, but for the purpose of what I'm talking about today, I'm going to be focusing on CSV. When it comes to CSA, that's a conversation we can have another time. But again, the trick here is kind of like what the wording that's been used in ISO 14971 and ISO 13485. We take a risk-based approach. The higher risk things, yes, we need to double down on them. But the things that are a bit lower risk, maybe we can let them slide. That's the base that we need to do. Because if you just had to validate everything, you'll be spending hours and hours validating and you would never release a medical device on the market. So the idea being here is you do a risk assessment and you see the level of validation that's required. So why do we do CSV? This is an important one. It's a requirement. Under ISO 13485, which is a standard, and then we have 21 CFR 820, which is a regulation, which is required for medical device manufacturers to validate the software used in either production and or their quality system. What do I mean by validation? Can the software do the job that you require it to do? So if you anything to part of your QMS and or production, can the software do what it needs to do? And how do you do that? You validate it, you test it, you set up certain protocols. You throw a few things at it and you say, okay, can it actually do? And again, if you don't validate your software, how on earth would you ever know that it's able to do the job? You know, you just buy a software and you just assume that it's going to do its job, but you need to test it. That is the purpose of validation. 
And the more preemptive approach is just forget regulation or standards or any requirements, etc. What are the modes of failure of the software? If you stress test something, that's where you're going to know, okay, what is the breaking point for this software? When does this software get confused? Where are the issues with this software? And then by doing validation, you can quite clearly pick up, okay, this is what the issues are with this software. And you can put preventive measures in place. The last thing that you sadly want to do is have software and then go out there and you create a device that sadly injures or even worse kills somebody. That's the purpose of validation. And it's very important that people realize that in medical devices, we're not playing with people's lives. So this is not something that we should take lightly. So first thing, of course, is which software is in scope of software validation? So if you have a software medical device, as Malisha mentioned earlier, she works with a software medical device company, that's not what we're covering here. This is software being used in the production and or your quality management system. So what's covered? Document repositories, SharePoint, G Drive, and internal servers, et cetera. Where are you keeping your approved documentation? Where are you keeping your draft documentation? Where are you keeping your superseded documentation? That's all that needs to be validated. Cloud-based forms and document workspaces. If you're using cloud-based systems, of course, that needs to be validated. CRM software. Now, this is a little bit of a gray area. Are you keeping your inquiries, contracts, complaints in that CRM software? Then it needs to be validated. If it's simply something for generating leads and keeping up with them, out of scope. Some HR software, so Joe, we, we talked about this earlier on, something that may not be in scope. Now, if it's just on board, uh, if it's basically things like, you know, interviewing people, booking sick leave, et cetera, we don't need to validate these things. But if we're keeping things like training records, conducting training on that HR software, then that's part of things where it comes down to competence and training records, et cetera, that needs to be validated. GitHub, if you run a software medical device company and your source code is on GitHub, you need to validate that. Can people log into GitHub? Can the right people go in and edit the code if they need to, et cetera? Shop for production software. So if you're a traditional medical device manufacturer, so let's, let's face it, 80% of medical device companies are still your traditional medical devices, physical products. If this shop floor production software, that needs to be validated. Can it do what it needs to do? And Excel spreadsheets is quite an interesting one. If you have an Excel spreadsheet, for example, like for monitoring um, goods in, goods out, and there's algorithms on there, there's calculations on there, et cetera, we need to make sure that those calculations work and the software is able to do the job. And then people say, oh, but Karen D, this is a big company like Microsoft, right? Uh, Ross, you got a question? Feel free to go ahead. I do, yes, if you don't mind. So um, let me just make a, an extreme example. And it's very re relevant to my business, uh, as okay. Joe knows. If I'm getting quality reports out of the FDA, do I have to validate the FDA's database and the FDA's qu query interface to get those adverse events uh, data? I would say in that case, no, but if you're using systems in house, as in it's going through a trailer board, et cetera, you probably need to validate that those complaints are coming through. That information is actually coming through the other end. So that's something which, you may need to validate. Right, which is precisely my business is we are facilitating and aiding and accelerating the uh, access to the FDA's data sets for industry to track quality events and trends. Are you 13485 certified or? We are not. Okay. Are you a medical device manufacturer? No, we are a data service, a data research service provider, SaaS. Okay. So in that case, there's no requirement for you to do so, but common sense would dictate that you would test that system. That Which we do, but through. we haven't done it to the point of certification. No, in that case, then you're not certified. You're not making claims that you are, then yeah, you don't need to do this. You don't need to have a documented record effectively. Very good. Interesting. Thanks. Sure. So basically, that's what it is with software. It comes in scope. And generally, the way that I do it, and uh, Mark, you have a question? Feel free to go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm so sorry. I mean, it just kind of tripped my mind. I looked at this one more time. Um, were you aware that the FDA put something out within the last year, year and a half, yeah. I think it was, uh, that said that they are no longer going to be looking at validation of documentation repositories? That if, if, you, if you're just storing documents, they're not going to be requiring the validations anymore. It was a pretty big thing because we were looking at practically everything, uh, to your point, practically everything that was uh, quality oriented and quality systems. They said they're no longer going to be doing that. I don't know if you had seen that message. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Uh, but on ISO 13485, you still are required. So yeah. basically, that's, the, yeah. that's what yeah. we have exactly. today is ISO 13485 and CFR 820. And interestingly so, the, the FDA is moving to ISO 13485, so I don't know if they're going to skip that part when they transition to that. I'm not sure on that point. Well, f funny enough about, uh, let's see, sometime last year, I was actually on a group that uh, was talking to the FDA because FDA was presenting the new uh, 21 CFR 820 
one of the things they were uh, saying was that they're revamping everything. Of course, it's all shifting over to harmonizing the 1345s. Uh, there are seven uh, sections to 820, the newly rewritten written one, seven sections, and it's mostly definitions. Everything else just basically just says go to 1345. So whatever 1345 says, which also alludes to 14971 at risk, we will have to do. So again, FDA is just kind of saying, we're not worried about this right here, but it doesn't matter if they move over to 1345. Mark, would you please send that to me? I'll be interested in reading that. So, you know, I, Mark, is that I actually was with an FDA inspector last November, and I asked her on it, because she, at the end of the inspection, she ended, she goes, do you have any questions? And that's the question I asked about, was this risk-based approach? And she looked at me, and she goes, they may be moving that way, but the law <laughs> of 21 CFR Part 11 does not exactly. allow me not to validate. That's what she exactly. said. Exactly. my face. She goes. Well, part 11, right? Part 11. So that's yeah. data storage. That includes yeah. data storage for your QMS. Yeah, well, that's, that's kind of weird that they would put out something like that. Then, I, right? I think they just don't have resources. They don't have the resources to focus on things like that. That's less less impactful than potentially your CAPA system. Yeah, but when I asked her point Blake, she I said, look, if I have a white paper that demonstrates compliance and I accept that white paper and maybe I do one or two test steps, would that be acceptable? She goes, yes, because that's <laughs> the bare minimum I would expect from you. She goes, but if you have nothing. She goes, I will give you a 43. And she was pretty blatantly blunt with me on that factor. But, you know, to the risk-based approach, it's not a do nothing. It's a, I've done my analysis. I made sure everybody can log in and everybody could create a record. And that's what I was happy with. Yeah. And okay. I think more just from the requirements perspective, you're going to be one of validating your document repositories. Can you get to your backup system? Can you actually access the thing? So if we just remove regulations and requirements and standards, it's just common sense to do these tests. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So conducting validation, what are the steps? Of course, there's planning. Then we have the risk assessment, which and there's conducting and evidencing, which is the doing part. And the number four is the maintenance phase. So planning. Under ISO 13485, you are required to have a documented procedure for computer software validation. So first thing, make sure you actually have a procedure in place and forget what the standard says. If somebody in your company wants to do validation, they need to have a paper in front of them that tells them how to actually do this. So that's the first thing, make sure you've got a documented procedure for it. Second one is create a list of all the software that you use in your company. And the reason I say all the software is that you can sit there and look at the scope. What is this software doing? Why do we use this software? What is the purpose of this software? And then you can mark them as in scope or out of scope for the QMS and or production. And importantly, any time that you say something is in scope or out of scope, what are your reasons why? The reason I do that, if you have an FDA inspection or you have an ISO 13485 audit and an audit that picks up, hey, you're using XYZ software. Why is this out of scope? You have your reasoning on paper. You have the justification there. And you can just pull up to the audit and say, hey, look, when we did our assessment, this is what the software is doing. And this is why we put it out of scope. So that's something you want to do. Another one, especially for the SAMD companies, please speak to your software guys because they have a really bad habit of using software that they don't tell you about. And then that software may be in scope of the QMS. So always speak to your software people. And especially with software as well, look at the add-ons. So for example, if you're using something at Amazon AWS, there's additional software within AWS that may potentially affect your QMS and or production. So always speak to your software guys, especially for the SAMD companies. Mara, please feel free to go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, she's not. Uh, uh, unless you muted your microphone on your own end. Happened before. She'll come back to us. Okay. No problem. Okay. I'll carry on then. So yeah, that, that was the main thing. So, and again, build the teams. Who will be actually be testing this? Who will be testing what? When would you be testing and how would you be testing it? There's nothing wrong with saying we're going to be testing it in the month of June, July, August. You know, you don't have to necessarily state certain dates, you know, with certain companies and availability, et cetera. It may be you test over two months, maybe you test over three months. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's what you basically want to be putting within your plan itself. So basically when you have your, oh, sorry, I've gone far ahead of myself. Give me a second. Um, okay, there we are, basically. So, so just give me a moment. It's my first time using G slides. So basically, when it comes to computer software validation, that's basically what you want to do for the plan. You want to make sure what is the software that's in scope? What is the software actually doing? Who are the teams? Uh, what software is actually being used? Why are you using that particular software? 
And then of course, uh, user access group is an important one as well. And I especially say this for document repositories. Uh, you want everyone in your company to have your approved procedures, right? But then when it comes to your draft and your superseded, you only want to select few to be actually going in there because you don't want people going in there and potentially getting access to draft and superseded documents and potentially messing that up. Ross, you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, just maybe a little more clarity on, on how deep do you go? So, you know, somebody's got some software, they're using it for quality systems or document controls or something. That software uses some Google tools or Amazon Web Service tools. Those tools use some public domain modules uh, those things use, uh, you know, some programming. How deep are you responsible for going? I'm coming on to that one, Ross, in the next few slides. Okay. Perfect. So that's your planning. So risk assessment, Ross, perfect time for your question. High risk systems need a thorough validation. We really need to dig deep into it. Medium to low risk require some to little validation. So what are the examples of risks, outages? If you're a software medical device company and your Amazon AWS server goes down, potentially your device no longer works. Whereas <clears> if you're just a typical medical device physical manufacturer and your AWS service goes down, okay, fine. Your device is set out in the market doing its job. Um, unwanted modification of documentation. So this is what I was talking about, um, document repository. So Ross agreed and the FDA talked about that. And Nelly mentioned that as well, uh, talking about how the FDA is not gonna necessarily validate your document repositories. You don't want unwanted modifications of your documents. You don't want the wrong person who doesn't know anything about medical devices going in and changing your SOPs. So that's something you want to do as well. And of course, now in the digital world, cyber attacks. You know, what's the cyber attack going to do? Is it going to shut down your device? If you're a SAMD company and you have a cyber attack, that person may go in and change the code the way that your software works and potentially gives out the wrong information, which can potentially cause harm. That's a very high risk that we need to look into. Whereas if you're just a physical device manufacturer, you know, you're making something like surgical equipment, you have a cyber attack. Your company may go down, but your products are still doing their job. You know, there's no internet connection there. So it kind of comes down to that. And it's just, you make a rational decision. What is the impact of this going down, et cetera? So what risks are we talking about, basically? So things like temporary outages, permanent outages. And people may remember in August 2020, there was an outage of Google. I don't know if any people on the call remember that. I think Google went down for a couple of hours. Now, if you had a Google workspace and you couldn't get caught hold of some SOPs or something, fine. But then if you're relying on Google Workspace for your device to actually operate, that's something you need to look into. And this is an important thing that I say for companies is, I ask a lot of the clients that I work with, what's your backup system? Oh, Google backs up itself, SharePoint backs up itself. What if it's an outage? Always have a backup for your backup. Now, it's very unlikely that Google and Microsoft will go out at the same time. So what I often say to clients is make sure that you have a backup system that's based on something outside of that. So it mitigates that risk. So Calculate the risk, what's the impact, and that's the level of validation you want to go to. Ross, does that answer your question? Perfect. So how do you actually do it? This is an important one right now. Some companies silly make the mistake where they write a validation report and say, we're going to do X, Y, Z, and we did it, and they tick a box and they sign it. I think, where's your evidence? And generally, the, I said the most rational way around it is to take screenshots of what you're doing. So if you're looking at things like user access groups or et cetera, and my recommendation is when you're taking a screenshot, take the screenshot of your whole page with the time and date at the bottom, which actually shows that you did it on that particular date, like you said you was going to do. So screenshots, uh, videos is another option as well, but don't make the mistake of where companies just sign a report and say, we did X, Y, Z, they sign it and they do it. That doesn't mean anything. Whereas if you have a screenshot and evidence, and then again, like I was talking about earlier, outside of requirements and regulations and standards, it's just common sense to validate your systems. You run a business at the end of the day and you want to make sure that your software is doing the job that it's required to do. And again, with the work that we're in in medical devices, we're playing with people's lives. So I say to companies, please make sure that you're validating because the last thing you want to do is create devices that potentially harm or even sadly kill people. So validation is something that needs to be done. But again, you take a risk-based approach. If something is high risk to medium risk, you really want to go the extra mile to make sure that it's doing its job. If something is low risk, and this is an example that I do with a lot of clients of mine as a test. I say to my clients, he goes, what is your complaint system? How do you go about reading with complaints? He goes, hey, we have an online form and you know, you go on the website and you do X, Y, Z. I don't tell them. I do a secret shopper and I put a complaint in and I jump on a call with them next week and say, hey guys, have you had any complaints? And they say, no, we haven't. And I quickly realized their complaint system is broken. So if somebody had an adverse effect with that device, they try to put it through. And again, this is the thing with companies is complaints can come anywhere. It can be via your online portals. It could be via web forms. It could be just somebody sitting in a local Starbucks saying, I had this product from this company. How are you mapping that? Social media, that's a new one as well. And if there's Instagram pages, Facebook pages, validate these systems. 
you want to make sure that the complaints are coming into you and you're dealing with them properly. And again, another interesting one is, is, and this is another one for the scope of software is linked systems. So I'll speak to some clients and be like, how do you get your complaints? Because, hey, there's a web form and that goes into a Trello board. Okay, uh, we validate your Trello, but we haven't <coughs> validated the web form. You want to validate the whole link, the whole mm -hmm. system. That's something that's very, very important. So basically you want to compile that into a report. Now, all the evidence doesn't have to be into a report. So with some of the SAMD companies that I work with, they're usually using things like Jira. They open Jira tickets for each particular software that they have and they put the evidence there. And then within the report that have the Jira reference, you know, number one, number two, number three. So where you store it is not really too important as well. And again, for the companies out there that are using Jira, manually download your XML file every week or so. Because again, if the Atlassian systems go down at any given time, you still have the XML file. So you can actually get your data whenever you need to get that basically. So that's my recommendation. Anyone using any online platforms, download the XML file and keep that somewhere. I have a question. So, these, these major platforms, you're talking about Jira at last. I mean, these are major, major systems. For you to validate it, how would your results be different than anybody else who would validate this? It's like, make sure your Facebook is working. Okay, well, it, that has billions of customers. Why should my outcome be different than when you validate yours or you validate yours? Wouldn't we all have the same? Basis. Yeah, I agree with you on that point, but the thing is, it's, uh, are you receiving that complaint? There could be various reasons. Can you actually access the business Facebook account? Have you validated that? But for example, if you have a business Facebook account, and if for whatever reason you're not able to log into it, how are you going to see the complaints? Is that the extent? I mean, validating just, clearly you guys know I'm in marketing, I don't do this aspect, but is I'm thinking that validating is far more complex than do you have your password? Password, potentially multi-factor authentication, uh, user access. So you basically, it's very simple when you want to validate something like a complaint system, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. Are you receiving the complaints? That's it. And can you send a message back to that particular person? So for example, if somebody emails you or messages you via Facebook saying, okay. I had X, Y, Z problem with your product. Okay. Did you receive make that? Sure or were you able works. to message Sounds a lot less intimidating than validating your yeah, system. Yeah, make sure it works. That's probably the best word, wording of UCI, Joe. Yeah, Joe, it's, 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 it's less software and more process in that yeah. case. Yeah, and so validated means that it's suitable for use. That doesn't mean, um, yeah. Okay. It's not it much thing. more intimidating to my naive ear. Marin, you have your hand up. Have you sorted out your microphone issues? Yeah, I, I have. It doesn't always Perfect. collect um, consistently. It's validated since before this call. Yeah. Mar um, Mara's validated uh, her microphone issues. I have. Um, so the uh the intended use as ginger said is the important thing there yeah. so you can't you know if you're using facebook for just family stuff and somebody else is using facebook for getting complaints you're using it for two different purposes so going back to the risk-based thing as karen deep said that's the important part um, and the whole intent of the validation is to make sure that you've validated the tools that you're using the software tools that you're using for your particular use so it doesn't mean that you're going, for example, and verifying that Microsoft Word is working. Um, you're just making sure that the data you get from it is adequate for what you're doing. In many cases, you do that by doing approval in a document control system. Mm -hmm. So you've got a secondary layer of mm -hmm. determining that the information is correct. But, yeah, Joe, the other thing too is that you, you don't have to, say if you're using Excel, it's kind of like what Karen Deep was saying, is that if you're using Excel, and you're putting information in and you have any kind of, of formulations or calculations, um, you have to be sure that those calculations are correct. So you have to actually do some inputs and outputs to make sure that you don't have to say that Excel works, that's a given, that's commercial off the shelf software. But if you have specific data to your particular uh, company or your particular product or processes. That's, and sounds a lot less intimidating. Yeah, it's just it's just the stuff that you're putting in saying, okay, I have to have these calculations because I'm going to receive a number at the end that's going to tell me how well my processes do, such as uh, CPCPK, okay, so it's the process capability. So if you're putting in CPCPK formulations and you're putting in your numbers, then you have to make sure that that formulation is right and that the numbers make sense given the fact that you put some sort of inputs in. Okay, fan favorite, Michelle Watt. Um, so I've had a customer that for uh, probably over 10 years, they have used this open source ticket system 
to uh, log their complaints and track them. And I begged, pleaded, like, you got to do something for validation. But in, in the case, and they wouldn't, but in the case of an open source system where you have no idea about the changes that's happening in the background, I mean, is it is it adequate to do what you guys have been talking about, about validating, meaning just that it's suitable for use? Like, my view on that, Michelle, is uh, you just monitor the changes on the open source system. So obviously open source systems, every time they have updates, version one, two, three, four, four, five, six, et cetera, maybe through your management reviews or something. So as long as you put the effort through, I mean, a lot of things are outside of our control. So as long as you've got documented evidence that you know, you're actually putting an effort in there to monitor these complaints and monitor what the changes are in that software, I think that's about as far as you can go. You know, it's a little bit of a rabbit hole. You can really end up spending your whole time just doing validation. Yeah. I think just take the risk-based approach and do the best that you can. You know, there's only so mm -hmm. many things that are in our control and that's it really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you, Karandeep. Excellent presentation. Um, Michelle, I think the open source one is, um, there are two aspects to it. If they're using that as a um, complaint record holder system, then it's a different answer. But if they're using it to become aware of a complaint, so it's just an input, but their actual process is somewhere else. Oh, no. then they can, the so, <laughs> so the open source software is holding complaint data. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that makes it a little bit more trickier. I, I think that this whole validation of software and, and current, they've very um, nicely touched on, uh, you know, this off the shelf type of a software or companies are having other plugins to make their system work. That gets complicated. So end of the day, the records that um, that any system holds, quality records, there has to be some level of controls or validation about it. So I think the risk-based approach, seeing how does this open source getting modified and become still effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a challenging one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Barry. Thank you, Karen Deep. That's a great, uh, great presentation so far. A question on the cybersecurity side of things. How are you validating that piece of it and are folks buying a software that already comes with uh, cyber protection and or security mm -hmm. or are they putting another software or platform on top of their existing uh, softwares? So under 13485 and CR 4820, there's nothing specific when it comes to cybersecurity as such. So I suppose the only thing that you're validating is that you have access to what you need to do and the software is able to do its job. I don't really think the cybersecurity piece itself needs to be validated. But again, yeah, I, it is common sense to make sure that the company has got some sort of security in place. Ginger, we were ahead. saying, we were saying I'm earlier, sorry, sorry, yeah. In, we were saying that. earlier though that we wanted to make sure that you know your data was secure and that you know information that would be used for quality decisions, so on and so yeah. forth, in either your manufacturing or quality system were not subject to uh, to uh, manipulation. Yeah, so it's not in the FDA regs. It is mentioned extensively in. FDA's new guidance, right? Um, to to be looking for that, and so maybe you're going to do random penetration testing, and you know, on those systems yourself to be sure, especially the critical ones. If you're going to lose your complaint records and things like that, you're going to have a problem. Kelly, Kelly. Um, one of the things I want to bring up, just as a reminder for the team about. Oh, I want to say 10 years ago, I was in a notified body inspection and they had automated backup processes that were validated. We had all the evidence and the auditor said, what human is reviewing that for accuracy? They could, we spent four hours going over it. So even though you have an automated backup validated system, there's still some anticipation that a human being is going to review that report for accuracy. So like for me, we have a manual backup system. I have a form. And my, my doc control people go and sample three folders and three random records and say, yep, I can open it and they sign it. But, and that's because of that experience of the automated backup process where I've implemented that. So just make, this is something to consider when you're doing that kind of activity. Question is, would you do it daily or would you just, you know, include monthly. that as one of your internal audit things to periodically yeah. check? We do it monthly. So what they do is um, my team, because we didn't want to validate the backup process, uh, my doc control people have a fireproof safe at their house that they have a hard drive for every company. And once a month, they do a manual backup of all the data. They do the sampling of the form. They sign the form. They put it in that backup folder. They put the hard drive back in the fireproof safe. 
that's a hundred percent verification. Therefore, yeah. I don't feel there's no need to validate that. Yeah, yeah. Or sampling verification, excuse me, not hundred percent, but it's right. Aaron, you have another question? Uh, just a quick response to Nellie's. Um, the, the goal is to make sure your data is accurate. Mm -hmm. So whether you're doing it by 100% inspection, by sampling, or by validating the process, all of those are achieving the same goal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that understanding that there's multiple ways that you can show your data is correct is really important as you're discussing this topic. Because it's not like you have to validate a process by doing a plan and test and all of that. The goal is you just need to be able to produce evidence that your data is accurate. Yeah. And then of course, the, the more important thing is revalidation and monitoring. So especially when we're working with things like cloud-based systems, there's always updates happening. My view is of course, monitor those, sign up to you know any newsletters or anything that they have, you know, version one, revalid X, Y, Z feature, this has happened. That's another way to do it as well. Another way to do this is document it in your management reviews. You know, this is actual evidence to show that you're actually doing something in terms of the monitoring side. So if an auditor or an FDA inspector turns up saying, you know, how do you monitor X, Y, Z? At least then you have a documented record of where this is basically done. That, that's something that you need to be doing, of course. So yeah, that's the most important one. And uh, Maren, do you have another question? Yeah, for all those IT people that may be out there, this comes back to defining your requirements for the software before you go out and purchase the package. So mm -hmm. if one of your requirements for your software is that you need to be able to tell when changes are occurring, then you're not going to look at software packages where you can't tell when the changes are happening. So defining the requirements up front so you know what the software needs to do um, is key to making the validation part a whole lot easier. Perfect. Luke, you have a question? Oh, you're not yes. joining us with a beer this time. What happened? Oh, uh... May contain H2O uh, water. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is it okay to treat uh, software packages as a black box and only do output validation? Like uh, engineers, we have uh, tremendous complicated software packages, and it's very hard to validate those. And there's an output uh, review anyway. So we don't care what happens with the software package as long as we can. Uh, scrutinize the output, it would be okay, wouldn't it? Uh, yes and no. That's a bit of a gray area there. Uh, can it consistently and reliability, in terms of reliability, give the same output each and every time? It's going into a black box, but can it give the same result every time that you require yeah, but it? The, the output is checked anyway. You have a, a checklist saying, uh, are the boundaries okay? Are, are... So, so I don't care what the, the software does or what software version does. If the output is not okay, it all automatically sifts out. Mm -hmm. But interesting one. So yeah, if it gives yeah. you the result that you need to and you can test that, then I would I, say I, yes. But then again, it's I had a, a discussion with to give a real answer. Yeah. And it could be the same with, with Excel and uh, yeah. and Word. So you use it and it creates output. But if you don't care about the process and only cares care about what it yeah. creates, then it it should be enough, in my opinion. But I had a large discussion with with an auditor. I, I would think you would need to do just, you know, as you said, boundary testing. Give it an invalid input and you get a crazy output that still matches. You'd be like, that's not right. I was going to say the same. I was going to say the same thing, Luke. How do you know it's normal until you know it's abnormal? <laughs> if you don't. If you don't know, you can't know normal until you know that, okay, if I put a bad input in, I get a bad output, then I know it's working. But if it's just, hey, we don't care, how would you know if somebody put in something bad if you always get it? I'll give you a good example of that. I was working with a, um, a sterile fill company out in California who was uh, mixing and matching their calculations so that no matter how much material they threw away, they were always giving you 105% of what you gave them. I gave them 30 liters of stuff. They threw away seven liters, <clears throat> which is a good percent. They came back with their calculation to say that, oh, we're getting normal. That's we're giving you 105% of what you wanted, which was absolutely not true. So the calculation was mixing theoretical with actual. So it would always come out that way. So don't be fooled into thinking that just because you're getting good outputs, you got to check that by putting bad out bad inputs just to see if you get the bad outputs. Yeah, I, I don't know. The, the output we create are step files and, and, and schematics and that kind of stuff. 
and those are always uh, um, uh, reviewed by by multiple persons. And you have a checklist for 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 uh, uh, for six hundred six hundred one related stuff. Uh, so, let me ask you this, because it's another joke in the technical world. How many signatures do you have on there? Do more signatures means more compliance? I know the regulatory people are going to laugh at that. No, it's, it, it's always three: the creator, the reviewer, and the approver. Seeing if yeah. you've done the process. But are right. they the right people? That's the, yeah. that's the question. Yeah, but but that's yeah. another part of your quality system. That your uh, is what Karen Deep said. It's your HRM. Yeah. Is everybody qualified and, for the job? Yes. Mm -hmm. but, that, but that's not related and, to the to the the uh, software package you're using. Yeah, I th I think that's right. You're qualified, but also that people are actually doing their job and review. Because yeah, and, you could have 20 people review, but somebody said, well, "I know this person will catch it, so I'm not really going to look hard." Yep. The other and thing you have, you have to make sure is, and this is a this happens tr trips everybody up. Everybody goes to review all these technical documents. Somebody revised the SOP, but nobody's trained to it. I, I can't tell you how many times an inspect you know you can get a 43 for that in the past because. They, they, they either didn't do their training because it was sent to them or the doc control person just forgot to send it to them. But what I've seen happening is that uh, software packages are validated in a way that is totally bogus. But you get some input, you get some output, it looks legit. Okay, we validated it. Yeah, it's, it's just a matter of how did you validate? Are you absolutely sure, are you confident that if you put in bad inputs, you expect to get bad inputs? It's garbage in, garbage out. Kind of a yep. thing. If you if you put the good in, you get the good out. If you put the bad in, you're supposed to get the bad out. That that's your confidence that this is working the way it's supposed to. Yep. Only has a question. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I'm responding to Luke. So is is um for me what this software is? Is it something like a CAD software or which one are you referring to? Oh, it's uh, uh, uh how do you call it? Uh, engineering assisted uh, software. Yeah, so so it, it it, engineers use product. a lot of different, you know, I have seen many different type of softwares used um, from designing boards to, you know, uh, test assurance softwares and stuff like that. And uh, mm -hmm. mostly vendors have level of validation done on those ones. So the company don't go verify CAD software itself. What they do is output only. So it's IQ OQ type of a verification that happens for those engineering soft or jigs or anything that goes from engineering to production. Same thing, right? It's an IQ OQ. So validation for what current deep is mentioning is a little bit different. It's a process and making sure that process is evaluated for a risk. And then you have a based on the risk, you make sure that it has a consistent output. That's validation. Um, but I, what I heard from you, I, I don't think I have seen engineering softwares getting validated and no auditors have ever asked for it. Okay. Oh, I will just say that auditors will definitely ask for that. Um, for sure, like we can get into <laughs> deeper into it, but the, <laughs> this, the, the software that they use for um, their, you know, for a mechanical drawings creation, for example, or PCBA creation, for example, those are IQ OQ. So it depends on what software we're talking about. Yeah, but what that also see, means it's, it's 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 going to it's going to be checked by the FDA. Your IQ, OQ, PQs, yes. PPQs, yes. all of yeah. that stuff is fair game for an auditor. So yeah, 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 but it's not the validation. That's what I was trying to refer to. I mean, the, the software guys, uh, you can see a monitor in my back, just beside my head, and yeah. there's a system running that's scraping off all the uh, user interface to see if something's changed. So every time there's a new um, uh, release of the software, it automatically checks if there's anything changed in the user interface. Mm. That is nice. It gives nice reports, and uh, I can highly recommend it. Yeah, I, so, I have seen a lot of PDA scripts, MATLAB scripts, Python scripts. Those are unique to the, the, the work that company is doing. They have to be validated because yes. they write those lab scripts and, and we want to make sure the output is good for that. So that's validation. But if it's a CAD drawing software, no, it's IQOQ. Marcia, good to see you again. You want to take yourself off mute? Yes, thank you. Thank you for letting me in. Sorry, I was extremely late, but I was really interested in uh, in listening to Karen Deep about this subject. For I do have a question. I don't know if he covered during the conversation or during the presentation. For um, clinical studies or studies, what do you have to have as far as early design of your software? 
And is that cover under one of the exclusions for, CF, for the CFRs or is there something that is covered in one of the ISO guidances? As far Maria, as I, Marcia, sorry, I'm not a clinical expert here. So if there's anyone here who's knowledgeable on clinical, maybe you can answer that question. So, but as far as the, as the as the documentation to be able to get into the, you know, to do a, a small trial or a small test with your with your software. So to do a clinical trial, you don't necessarily need a 13485 certification. You don't necessarily need to be CFR820 compliance. Okay. But I'm not sure what the clinical but, requirements are. Well, so yeah, yeah, there's FDA I wanted, guidance. You know, yeah, there, I wanted to make sure that you, if, if you need to follow the ISO well, or the CFR, if you're going to go and try, try it in the US. Um, so I would look at the FDA guidance on clinical uh, e-capture for clinical data systems. Uh, that's a new guidance, and then, you know, you can go to the European Clinical Trial Regulation, which also has information about that, or GAMP-5, but FDA certainly has expectation for retaining your master file um, even if electronically. It's a, yeah, even if it's the first few. Yeah, yeah, you need to be sure that that data is valid and accurately retained, Okay. and so what systems are you using to do that? Okay. But they do have that for e-consent and, and electronic data capture for clinical yeah. trials now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, we do use Viva and, you know, the, the Viva clinical vault. But as far as the project, to get into the touch the eye or image the eye or, then, mm -hmm. you know, which, what do you need as far as your design documentation? That was my, my question. Well, if you're designing your own, right, then it's custom homegrown software. You're going to have to define your specs and then how you're going to validate that. Okay. I mean, it's like any other custom software that. Yeah. Okay, that works. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, yeah, I I, th I have run clinical trials uh, in the U.S. and internationally. Um, so ISO one four five five is a requirement from a documentation perspective. You can have a paper based system or electronic system. So if you choose to have electronic system as a repository for procedures and stuff, sure, it's part of the you know verification that you want to do. But if you are talking about a patient data, right? So now you are not into the clinical trial procedural requirement, but you are actually having a protocol CRF and patient data. Those are yeah. the main component of it. So the patient data, if you are collecting images, for example, those will be part of your record. Those will be part of your CRF. Some images mm -hmm. you can have parameters captured on a piece of paper uh -huh. and you, you call yourself that that piece of paper is a record. Then, then the, the system that capturing the image is not a validation question the paper itself we'll human see. human reading writing yeah. is now is your record so okay. you're looking at that record will be acceptable to the fda understood so look for look for what um if you are using a system for someone to e uh, sign a informed consent then that system has to be validated because now the consent is a record yeah. and that has electronic processing behind it yes yes okay right? thank I you i hope it answered your question it helps. Thank you so much. Yeah. First thing I'm encouraged, Ronald made it to the end of this presentation. He doesn't seem intimidated about next week. Uh, you still good to present next week, Ronald? Oh, yes. Yes. I am uh, looking forward to that. I'll be speaking about uh, the so called uh, MDR extension. Um, that's, uh, yeah, some people may have not fully grasped that concept. So I'll talk about that. But um, uh, the main thing will be about the opportunities that it offers. And there are some interesting opportunities. So we're looking for that. Just take you just beyond the barrier of the current MDR situation. And uh, let's talk opportunities. Talk, let's talk how can you make good use of that and, and um, look into a brighter future if you, if you master this. So um, please join. Um, um, I'm still working on, on finding those opportunities. And now it's three. But, um, uh, hopefully, I have something like five or something uh, to uh, to uh, to to show um, that uh, it's not all bad news coming from Europe. Where are you uh, based? I'm based in uh, in the Netherlands, very close to Rotterdam. So if I look over my screen, um, and where are I you, look... Heiden? Sorry, where's my friend Luke Heiden? In the east, Enschede. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. We we're very far away. It's, no, it's, it's not far. Than... It's a two-hour drive. Yeah, well, in, in terms of cycling, it's 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 a full day cycling. Um, yeah, 
Well, you, and, 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 the, you have motor cars there in Europe now, yeah? Yeah, some people do, yeah. You must know our uh, family friend, uh, Mr. Udeman, Richard Houlihan. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're familiar with him. We'll see if we can't get him to join us next week uh, to, uh, to lend a hand. Uh, Goldie, still more to contribute. It doesn't end. <laughs> What else? What have you got to share? Um, sorry, you have to repeat your question. I was replying to Our somebody. Question was you have your hand raised? No, I, I I already asked. Uh, I was helping Marcia to answer her oh, question. Yeah, I'll lower your hand for you. It's all good. <laughs> um, a few uh, uh, just administrative things first. Karen Deep, thank you. You attracted a new audience for premium today. And uh, this is among the more robust conversations we've had in a while. So a lot of interest. So thanks for something so pointed and Definitely. timely. Um, I'm going to be in Anaheim on October 9th, if you're nearby. I'm going to be uh, flying in for around the AdvoMed uh, conference. I'm not sure how much of the event itself I'll be going to, but the night before I've been invited to moderate a panel uh, for DSO systems. So. Uh, if you're in town, let me know. Uh, second, welcome Ginger to Premium. She has returned to us. So if you want to talk with her on Slack, she's there. She didn't know that, but I just figured out why her email was messed up and you're there now. I just sent you a message. Great. And, uh, third is um, September, October it tends to uh, be people coming back from holiday. And um, there are a lot of things that they have been meaning to address. So if there are topics of particular interest to those of you assembled who want us to either suggest people that they'd like to have uh, contribute or if they themselves want to contribute something, uh, come September and the out months, we have uh, openings in the slot. So as you know, uh, this is a potpourri of all of the uh, different disciplines. And uh, if there's something that we've uh, left out recently that's of particular interest, Perhaps, Dr. Carr, if there's something you'd like us to be talking about now that you're, you have a, a lot of excitement at your company. Um, yeah, I'll be in Anaheim, too. Oh, cool. Thank you to uh, Maryland Department of Commerce. There's, they're uh, paying for my was it medical tech conference in Anaheim. Nice. It sounds like Maryland's the place to be. They're giving you tax incentives for investors. They're giving you grants left and right, paying for stuff. Yeah, I just received uh, official notice from NSF. I, I got my grant, my phase one NSF for 275 for our second iteration. And now we're only two months away from FDA. Wow. You're not even going to need investors soon. You're going to get to keep all of it yourself. You just keep getting all this free money. Yeah. I like that business model a lot. Very, very good. <laughs> Okay, uh, that brings us to the top of the hour. And I'll uh, wish you all a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank See you next week. Thanks, Joe. Bye. Thank you.